All the staff surrounding him is sort of akin to an attending nurse at a place for mom. Yeah. Right? right? Yes. Doesn't it? It, it? It's very bad. And, and you know, the, the Time Magazine write-up of that, that Biden interview, my favorite part, there's a last paragraph in their actual write-up where they said, this is a man who appears to be engaged with history. <laughs> like, truly, he's he's in a, of a time and a place. Like, man, th- this massage that you're giving him, he's going to have to pay you hush money <laughs> for what you're doing to him right now publicly. Uh, Democrat Rep Meek saying, Calling the Wall Street Journal after the interview saying, they just, you know, said that I should give you a call back. So, like, yeah, you probably have Andrew Bates with a gun to this guy's head <laughs> and, like, fucking tell him he's okay. <laughs> you know, I think the most amusing story of the last 48 hours was obviously those texts that Hunter was sending yes. when he was completely drugged up about Jill. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was like, well, but, I mean, a little. I mean, like, like, <laughs> and then you see the interviews from uh, House Democrat you know, members of Congress that are out there and they're like, well, but you should see behind closed doors. Mm. This behind is really- closed doors, he's like doing quadratic equations. Right. And, you know, he's over there like charting out Elon Musk's SpaceX trajectories to get to Mars. It's unbelievable. But, 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 see, the minute the door opens, he's back to like walking into walls and being a houseplant. But when that door is closed, there's something magic about that door. If you're watching it like you're watching a movie, then I try to forecast what the writer is going to do, the writer being God. And, you know, the, if, if you're God, then there has to be a health crisis somewhere between now and the election, right? I mean, that's that's Chekhov's gun that's over the man. <laughs> a new study reports that credit card rewards provide a lifeline for working class Americans. Rewards like cash back empower low and middle income families to pay for the rising price of groceries and gas. So why are DC politicians partnering with corporate megastores to steal cash back from families during skyrocketing inflation? The Durbin Marshall credit card bill takes billions from American families lining corporate pockets instead. Protect our credit card rewards lifeline. Tell DC politicians to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. Learn more at electronicpaymentscoalition.org. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. <laughs> Just a catching yeah. strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith. Hold the line and own the libs. It's time for our main Welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program. We have a sort of a recognizable figure sitting with the fellas here today. Yeah, we, we what is this, the sixth member? We, we first let in Duncan, then Afro, <laughs> and now Ben Shapiro is a member of Ruthless. <laughs> and now we got this guy. Just found him wandering around out front trying to make a difference. Yeah, I wish I could have stayed out of D.C., but you know, here I am, and so here we are together. <laughs> it's fewer and further between these days. You don't get up here very often. I try to stay out as... Much as I possibly can. I am less enthusiastic about this town than Joe Biden's base is about his electoral process. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to imagine. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. I mean, that's a low bar. It is. I mean, I can't imagine why they're not enthusiastic about an actual vegetable yeah. as president of the United States. <laughs> I, I do love that the Wall Street Journal ran like a full front page headline about how he's a vegetable now. Yeah. And why is that breaking news? It's well, like every time you see a study and the study's like, Study men like hot women. It's like I need a study for that. I also didn't like. I have a, I have eyes. Yeah. My brain works. I can see him talking or not talking, as the case may be. And they also sourced it to people inside the room, like wow. like they're telling us a secret. Well, you, you mean like me watching him on a TV in a room? Like, everyone in America knows he's no longer sentient, and that the only way they can get him up for the State of the Union is to jab him with some sort of amphetamine. <laughs> the guy in the back room hooked up to like a seven year old child, streaming the children's blood into him just so he can remain animate. It's insane. <laughs> Let's go right into that because, I, look, I, it's hard not to notice. First of all, when the corporate mainstream, whatever you want to call it, media, uh, writes something that everybody knows, that's a rare occasion these days. And this one in particular, everybody's run so much interference for mm-hmm. this guy. I mean, what was that piece in the Washington Post the other day about, like, uh, they had all kinds of clinical psychologists who were like, actually. Oh, yeah. They were saying that, actually, when you're older, you're wiser. And <laughs> oh. expert, expert saying. It was wow. on the front page of the paper, wow. by the way. Breaking news. <laughs> Warning yeah, us all to, to not to judge what it is that we see with our own eyes. Well, but the good uh, news is after he's dead, he can still vote Democrat, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, look, so the Wall Street Journal does this big piece, and I, like you, uh, was sort of underwhelmed by the fact that it was news, but the fact they were doing it, I guess it, you know, added a little something to it. It was sourced to 42 different interviews, uh, some Republicans who were willing to be quoted, and Democrats who were not, obviously. Right, right. Um, But they took notice of the obvious, right? And 
again, I'm shocked by this, it, just the fact that it's news. I mean, we've had two separate major transcripts of him being a senile dotard that have come out mm-hmm. in the last six weeks, right? We had the Robert Hur transcript. It was like full transcript of him not being able to put sentences together or not knowing when his son died. And, and then he did an entire press conference where he fell apart in the press conference, mixing Life. up the presidents of Mexico and Egypt, not knowing where his son got his rosary and all this kind of stuff. Right. And then he did this interview with Time Magazine, and people were treating that as though that was the this was the verbiage of Demosthenes. I mean, th- this dude was <laughs> so with it. He is sharp as a tack. He's like a razor. And then you read it, and in the transcript, it says things like, uh, Anyway. <laughs> and he sort of drifts. I was like, editor, there, there's an actual editor's note. Editor's note. He appeared to mean G, not Putin. In this Those are two completely different world leaders. He mixes up Taiwan and South Korea in the same interview. I mean, he, he's falling asleep in the interview. Yeah. And, and then he threatens to fight the reporter. I, I, I do particularly like when occasionally oh, yeah. you get combative old Joe. Yes. Where it's yeah. like where he woke grandpa up from a nap. He's like, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's Joe Biden in the middle of an interview. They wake up and go, I'll fight you. I'll fight anybody. I'll fight this can of insure. And it's like, okay, I mean, I'll pay money to see it, but I don't feel like you will. I, so I saw an interview. CNN did an interview with the guy who wrote the story and apparently conducted the interview. Was it Massimo? Was it Calabrese mm-hmm. or something like yep. that? Anyway, he was on there, and you know they're trying to promote this like it is a real thing, and like he was sharp and with it. And they kind of got to a question. It was like, oh, you know, how did he appear to you? It seemed like he answered all the questions. He's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> like he, even this dude couldn't cut, couldn't get on that road. He's just ah, you know, he's definitely old. I think his quote was something like. He's definitely older than he was four years ago. It's like, well, no so, shit. I have a general rule in politics, which is that usually critiques are correct. Yeah. Right? Like, uh, from both sides. Like, if somebody's critiquing somebody, usually the critique is largely correct. And I feel that's true about the entire Biden family. Yeah. You know, I think the most amusing story of the last 48 hours was obviously those texts that Hunter was sending yes. when he was completely drugged up about Jill. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, but, I mean, a little <laughs> he's ripping on Jill. He's like, ah, she's an idiot, and she's a, she's terrible, and she would a degree from University of Delaware. She didn't yeah. last through an Ivy League class. I'm like, well, in vino veritas, in crack veritas. I mean, like, not not totally false. And how, the fact that she's you? Edith Wilsoning this thing, that she's how, the one sitting there, like grabbing his hand and manipulating it into signing position. How, how, great. How dare you, Ben? She's a learned doctor. She is the greatest kind of doctor. My wife had to go to medical school to be a doctor, but but she went to a school named after her husband <laughs> to get an ed degree. You think she got it? That was a tough acceptance program. Uh, really think? rough. Yeah, I bet Absolutely that, brutal. That interview was rough. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the only thing that would have made it easier if she'd said she was black, she would have gotten in. But she didn't have to do that. She's Biden. It's yeah, she's the Biden. <laughs> right. Just as good. Just but, as good. So, so to me, when I was reading it, I thought there were actually some kernels that didn't get as much attention as they deserve. So there was one part. Um, where the Wall Street Journal said that it, it became obvious to them that the White House was monitoring everyone that they were interviewing mm-hmm. and would get in touch with them. And they were demanding that, like, Democrat members of Congress would give them audio recordings of these interviews, right? And then uh, quoted in here is uh, Democrat Rep Meek saying, calling the Wall Street Journal after the interview and saying, they just, you know, said that I should give you a call back. So, like... yeah. <laughs> You probably have Andrew Bates with a gun to this guy's head and, like, fucking tell him he's okay. <laughs> and he's dumb enough to not be like, oh, I'd like to have some context for our discussion. Yeah. He's like, they said I should call you. Yeah. Like, oh this God. is a hostage. I'm, I'm holding up a copy of today's newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, they're all sort of – all the staff surrounding him is sort of akin to an attending nurse at a place for mom. Yeah. Right? right? Yes. Doesn't it? it? It's very bad. And, and you know, the, the Time magazine write-up of that – that Biden interview. My favorite part, there's a last paragraph in their actual write-up where they said, this is a man who appears to be engaged with history. Like, truly, he's he's in a, of a time and a place. Like, man, th- this massage that you're giving him, he's going to have to pay you hush money <laughs> for what you're doing to him right now publicly. Like, this is bad. Oh, my God. It, but it's incredible. And then you see the interviews from uh, House Democrat you know, members of Congress that are out there and they're like, well, but you should see behind closed doors. Mm. This behind is really- closed doors, he's like doing quadratic equations. Right. And, you know, he's over there like charting out Elon Musk's SpaceX trajectories to get to Mars. It's unbelievable. But, but, what, what, the minute the door opens, 
he's back to like walking into walls and being a house plant. But when that door is closed, there's something magic about that door. When the door closes, my God, the brain, the, the neuronal connections just form, and it's like magic. It, it's like it, it's like watching Einstein at work. He just grabs the chalkboard and he goes to town. Like, it, it, it's so clownish and it's so obvious, and everybody knows it. And that's why the part that's astonishing to me is that the the press keeps waiting for the polls to change. The mm-hmm. polls are not going to change. Yeah. We all know these candidates. They've been in the public right. limelight for decades. Mm-hmm. Donald Trump, I mean, this is the thing that's so funny is as we get older, time seems to compress. So we're all like, oh, 2016 wasn't that long ago. There's a full generation of voters for whom Donald Trump is the center of politics, yes. right? They, mm-hmm. who were 18 in 2016 yeah. and, and now are like in their mid-20s. Mm-hmm. There, there, there are people who have been watching Joe Biden in politics who are significantly older than like he was he was in politics literally 12 years before I was born <laughs> right so I mean the idea that there's gonna be some radical change of opinion about Joe Biden from here to the rest of the election I think is false I, frankly you know I tend to watch this like I'm watching a movie because otherwise it's just too depressing <laughs> and so if you're watching it like you're watching a movie then I try to forecast what the writer is going to do the writer being God <laughs> and you know the if if you're God then there has to be a health crisis somewhere between now and the election, right? I mean, that's that's Chekhov's gun that's over the mantle. <laughs> in Act One. I mean, Joe Biden has to have a physical collapse between now and November, clearly, and that's going to happen. It is Chekhov's gun. That's such a good point. We're all sort of waiting for it, right? And when that happens, that's when things are really going to get interesting because you could see a world where then Donald Trump like jumps over his skis, yeah. Right, where Donald Trump's like, "Well, he's dead," <laughs> and, right. and it, isn't that great? And you're like, oh no, you're not allowed to say that, Donald Trump. Stop it. You're not allowed to say that. Do not He's congratulate fine. his death. Do right. not congratulate. <laughs> hey, sorry for the looters and the haters. <laughs> and, you, know, you, you could see a world where, where he overplays the hand. But as I've been I've been saying this since like 2018, I said this in the White House, do somebody in the White House 50 feet from the Oval Office. I was like, if your boss can shut his trap, he'll be president forever. Oh, yeah. and, that, and that's true for Donald Trump right now. The best thing, ironically, there, there are two things that are great that have happened for Donald Trump, and both of them are perceived as bad things by the base. Number one, him originally getting banned from Twitter is like the best thing that ever happened to him. Oh, totally. Amazing for him. Yeah. In fact, I was recommending to people in the White House when he was president that they should build a fake Twitter app, put it on his phone, <laughs> so you tweet into a non-existent crowd, and then he'd be fed back a bunch of comments <laughs> telling him how awesome he was. He'd have like the happiest day of his life, and nobody would know what the hell he was tweeting, and everybody would be happy. And then that actually happened, and it's called Truth Social, right? <laughs> where, you know, where there's Twitter, and he gets banned, he builds his own like Twitter app that nobody reads and has ever seen, and he's super happy because everybody there loves him and it's awesome for him right so that that's number one thing that, that's been good for him number two these trials are excellent for him because number totally. one they, they because they, they lock him in a room mm-hmm. and he can't talk to, mm-hmm. to anyone he's just in a room not talking and then when he comes out he bitches a little bit about like how bad his life is and we're all like well it does kind of suck they're dragging you up for this garbage mm-hmm. and then he just kind of goes back to doing whatever he was doing yeah and meanwhile right. joe biden's over here setting the world on fire yeah. yes mm-hmm. i mean like the 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 foreign policy of the United States has not shifted this radically from excellent to horrific, certainly in my lifetime. I mean, this has just been – Totally agree. It, it, It's unbelievable. And that's the place where, honestly, even more than the economy where, where Biden deserves a lot of blame. But a lot of that's the Federal Reserve. Some of that is supply chains. When it comes to foreign policy, the president has plenary power over foreign policy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the only thing that you can truly fix or completely fuck up in a massive way is foreign policy. Yeah. And he has – screwed the pooch so badly on foreign policy it is it is astonishing totally i mean a massive ongoing flame in the middle of europe and ukraine you got the middle east on fire and he's taking the wrong side of the conflict i know in the like, middle east it's insane you have the chinese right now their only math is like okay if we can like somehow prod biden into winning we get four more years of him treating us with kid gloves one of my other predictions again if you're writing this as god is that if this election starts to open up if you start to see donald trump with like a five-point lead come august i certainly would not be surprised if china decides it's go time on taiwan it's mm-hmm. like okay we don't want four years of donald trump so we're gonna we're gonna blockade taiwan like right now and just go for it because mm-hmm. we're a declining power demographically economically and we'd much rather have to deal with this doddering fool in the white house than, than donald trump who's completely you know, i was talking with with president trump you know this is a couple months ago we did a fundraiser for him and uh, he is an amusing human being. Donald, Donald he's Trump is very funny. <laughs> he's so he's so fucking funny. He's, he's so funny. And he and he, he's talking about foreign policy. And he and he says he's talking about how October seventh never would have happened if he was president. He's like, you know why that never would have happened? Because I would have bombed the shit out of Iran. <laughs> and then he's like, and you know, Ukraine never would have happened either. Because if Ukraine, if, if I told Vlad, I told Vlad, I said, Vlad, if you go into Ukraine, I'm going to bomb the shit out of you. And Vladimir Putin said. 
you won't do that, Mr. President. I said, I might. <laughs> <laughs> I might. What was the line, and, the line he had? With, the beautiful towers in Moscow. The golden, the beautiful the turrets. Golden turrets. turrets. Right. turrets. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually, here's the thing. Foreign policy is actually not complex at all. It's a fifth grade playground. If you're the biggest mm-hmm. kid on the playground, you get to push everybody around. Right. The United States is the biggest kid on the playground. And so Donald Trump being completely volatile, and you don't know whether he's going to hug you or whether he's going to clock you on the chin, that's actually a really good foreign policy. It's like Nixon yeah. madman theory. It exactly. works. Exactly. It's great. And, yeah. and Donald Trump is that. And so everyone is is afraid of him. And that's a good thing. It's good when the world is afraid of the yeah, United totally. States. As opposed to what we currently have, where it's like, well, we know they're not going to do anything, so we can do whatever the hell we want. I mean, how many red lines does does Joe Biden or his predecessor in the Democratic Party, Obama, have to draw oh my that everyone just runs right over the red line and nothing happens? Nothing happens. Remember, with Hezbollah, like, don't, don't, or Iran, don't. Uh, how's that don't working out for yeah, you? I mean, and actually, with Iran, he said don't, and then quietly saw to Voce, he's like, do. Right? Yeah. I mean, it turns out that he actually told the Iranians probably that they could launch an attack as I long think, as it wasn't too big. I mm-hmm. think a significant reason for that is I think the entire world sees the cognitive decline of how obvious it is, like literally asleep at the job. And in the in this article specifically, near the end, they close saying that like the White House said that uh, during the president's annual checkup, uh, the doctor said everything was okay, so there's no need for a cognitive test. Which is like, to me, that okay, if he was actually okay, the polls show the number one problem voters have with Joe Biden is they don't think he's cognitively fit. If he was, they would have taken the test, oh, yeah. released it on campaign T-shirts, made it a big deal. The fact that he will not is the crux of all the problems. They could get rid of it today, but they know he can't pass the thing. That's right. I think that's right. Well, we've got to take a quick break where we've got more with Ben Shapiro right after this. Hey, folks. My friends at Americans for Prosperity are again on the front lines fighting against the border crisis. It's clear the politicians aren't going to solve this on their own. It's going to take good old-fashioned grassroots activism, and that's what AFP specializes in. Americans for Prosperity Foundation has taken hundreds of concerned citizens to see the border for themselves, turning them into informed activists. And Americans for Prosperity knows just what we need. More border agents, more walls, and more technology. That's what makes Americans for Prosperity unique. They do the tough work of organizing and mobilizing everyday Americans to make a difference. In fact, they just announced a major campaign to hold Biden and his allies accountable for the crisis at the border. Learn more at securebordersecureamerica.com. That's securebordersecureamerica.com. All right, back here, Ruthless Variety Program with Ben Shapiro. Uh, You may have noticed this week the president decided, in fact, he does have the capability of doing something on the border. It's amazing. Something (laughs) he uh, has said for months that he couldn't do, didn't have the power to do. And it turns out his his poll numbers uh, uh, gave him a little extra ambition (laughs) to do something. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, first of all, how many times can he say he doesn't have the power to do something and then try to do it? (laughs) <laughs> right, he's been doing this over and over, right? He did this with student loan debt. Yeah, I can't, I can't single-handedly example. get rid of student loan. Wait, I might be able to. And actually, even in spite of the Supreme Court doing it, I'm going to brag to people that I'm ending around the Supreme Court. This is Captain, I'm the defender of democracy and yeah. our institutions, capital O, capital I, right? Our institutions, little trademark. Like, he despises the institutions. He doesn't care about them. They're obstacles to his ambitions. And so he just gets rid of whatever line in the sand he had and just erases it. The reality, of course, is that this executive order doesn't do anything like what it's supposed to do. I mean, it, it kicks in at like 2,500 illegal encounters per day between ports of entry. So that doesn't include the ports of entry themselves. I'm not amazing at that, but 2,500 a day is almost a million a year. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's before it kicks in the power to, quote unquote, shut down the border. He's not changing the interpretation of the amnesty, which would be the single handed way to do Basically, there are two things that have to happen. I went down to the border. I talked to Border Patrol a few months ago. And what they were saying is basically two policies end all of this. One is reinstate remain in Mexico. Remain in Mexico. Right, remain in Mexico. And two is when you come and claim asylum, you actually have to make a showing of credible evidence that you require asylum. You can't just come and say, I fear to go back to my home country and then be let off the hook. And then wait for 15 and then, months. And, 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 and then they just shuttle you into the interior and you disappear. You never yeah. show up for your follow-up appointment. Biden hasn't changed any of those things. Right. And so this was meant for public consumption, but mm-hmm. not to actually change policy. And again, it's very hard. I've been trying for months. It's very difficult to come up with a non-cynical explanation for why he's leaving the border open. Mm-hmm. Like what would actually be the non-cynical explanation? I guess it might be just ideological. Just ideologically, he believes that America ought to have an open border, that we're bad, that we're some sort of great colonialist center. I think it's that- actually worse than that. And so it, it, it's it's not that. It's what makes up the Democratic Party mm-hmm. to get to a governing coalition today 
is encompassed by absolute insanity, right? I mean, you've seen it on college campuses here over the last three months and all the anti-Semitic wild stuff that you didn't even know existed in our country. But then there's also this other piece of it that just fundamentally doesn't believe in American sovereignty. They yeah. just don't. Well, I think that one of the things we've been watching, and this is connected to foreign policy also and what's going on in Israel and world opinion and the mm-hmm. protesters, I think that what we're watching that is actually a civilizational danger is when we talk about intersectionality, what we're really talking about, and it's very hardcore, is basically just an army of losers. Mm -hmm. It's an army of people who believe that they've lost out in the system, and the system therefore has to be ripped down and destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have all these weird coalitions like Queers for Palestine, which of course is, you know, a punchline, except for the fact that it's not a punchline, it's quite real. Mm -hmm. And, And you have a bunch of people who disagree on everything except that the system has somehow screwed them and is of, you know, an obstacle to their success and their their flourishing or self-definition, and therefore the system has to be completely trashed. Joe Biden's base is those people. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the, the problem for the Democratic Party, and this happens with every party that is predicated upon revolution, is eventually the revolutionaries eat the people at the top of the food chain. And that's mm-hmm. what you're seeing right now. This, this, this feels very much, obviously, like 1968 when you had kind of an older, somewhat liberal candidate like Hubert Humphrey who's trying to hold back the encroaching tide of change that is sort of the McGovernite wing of the Democratic Party and yeah. it break, breaks out into massive riots and all that. That's what this feels like. It feels like the Democratic Party in 2020 in their efforts to defeat Trump, they were so upset about Trump having beaten Hillary, which they never accepted. And that is, again, like the, the cardinal sin of the Democratic Party is not just acknowledging that Hillary Clinton was a bad candidate. So many things yeah. have sprung from them not being willing to acknowledge oh. the reality that Hillary Clinton was a shitty candidate yep. and lost to Donald Trump. You have the entire Russia collusion stuff, the perversion the of the Russia. Department of Justice, the perversion of the FBI. Mm-hmm. You know, the, so many things spring from this. Well, it broke and, the damn internet. You yeah, know? It, it, I mean, yes, like, yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually did. I mean, it broke a lot of the social media companies who were then blamed for all of this right. and decided right. to shut off the tap in terms of free speech because of all of this. God and forbid so, suggest she go to Wisconsin. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so and so come 2020, there was this feeling in the Democratic Party that the if we can get the base jazzed up, if they're really ready to go, mm-hmm. then we can use that as jet fuel. And then we can kind of I mean, we can be the people who are steering the jet. We can we can be the pilots and we're, we're containing the jet fuel. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the problem is that this jet fuel is is not consistent. This jet fuel is going to explode. And you're and you are seeing it explode every so often. I mean, 2020 was a very, very big explosion, and Democrats got away with it because they expanded the voter base by 22 million people through mail-in voting. Mm-hmm. And that, that's not, quote-unquote, cheating, but it's certainly changing the rules in ways that absolutely benefit Democrats. Mm-hmm. Well, as they as they keep doubling down on that base, that revolutionary base, they need them more than ever, which is what's so weird about Joe Biden. Joe Biden's failure as president of the United States is based on one fundamental misassessment that you would have assumed he wouldn't have, which is he won based on being a dead moderate. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And what he gave us is a dead radical. That's, ex- yeah. that's, and, ex- that's and, exactly right, because when Joe Biden's hand was on the Bible, Elizabeth Warren's hand was on the wheel of government, and her people flowed into the Biden administration. Maybe it was part of a deal that they cut earlier in the primary to get her support behind him. Maybe this was part of a plan that was unspoken that we don't know totally about. But the point of the matter is the hardest of the hard left of the Democratic Party is operating the White House. And that's why they sh- they open the border up. And that's why they're doing everything that they're doing. Going against on, the Supreme Court on student loans. Uh, everything. I mean, it's, a fra- I, it's, a, it's a fragile coalition. You know, I guess my larger point is I don't think everybody really understands. You look at the Republican Party. Yeah, it's gotten a little weirder in terms of trying to stitch together what a majority looks like, right? Some more uncomfortable than others. But if you look at the Democratic Party, I mean, you have like, radical environmentalists and union people. They don't agree on a damn thing. But you got to have them both. Right. Right? They've got complete radical anti-Semitic folks with the open the borders and let everybody else in. And, and, and like how that all stitches together in coalitions that don't literally agree on anything is anybody's guess if you don't have like – he's not Donald Trump, right? So their whole thing is they're trailing and you're looking at these poll numbers, lack of enthusiasm – uh, underperforming with young people, with black people, all these other things. They're basically trying to tug all these radical elements. Yeah. And, and that's the border decisions. I think that's like also, that. a, it's a bigger problem for the Democratic Party not to have a coherent program than for the Republican Party, not yeah. to have a coherent program. The Republican Party can survive as an oppositional party because by nature, conservatism is oppositional to a lot of government right. action, right? You can unify around, we want to stop you doing this. But the Democratic Party has always been a fairly effective channeling of mm-hmm. revolutionary impulses mm-hmm. into actual political action, right? This is why conservatives are always like, what have you ever conserved? And there's something to that in the sense the Democratic Party is always moving forward. I mean, it's always, yeah. what's the next thing? What's the next thing? Well, what happens when it feels inside the Democratic Party, like the person at the top of the ticket is inhibiting the revolutionary change you want to see, 
And when the enthusiasm for defeating Donald Trump in oppositional fashion just isn't what it was in 2020, mm -hmm. because in 2020 it was like everybody was on fire. Yeah, and he's and the incumbent. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in 2024, everybody kind of knows what they're getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? In, in, in 2020, there was, there was this feeling because of the, the riots in the streets and because of COVID, there was so much chaos that it was like, oh my God, we just need stability. We yeah. just need, yeah. like a corpse would be amazing at this point. Just like somebody <laughs> there who's not even alive would be incredible. And then they got that and he wasn't that. And so now they're looking at this and they're like, you know what? You know, Donald Trump's presidency in very many ways was actually a more stable time for America. The period no 2017 question. to 2019 was a significantly more stable period for America than 2021 to 2024. No question. And so if Donald Trump has stability on his side, what exactly is the calling card for the Biden administration? Mm. It's why he's leaning so heavy on the our democracy kind of stuff. But this is where I think that the trials against Trump actually really hurt him because it, if your case is that Donald Trump is the threat to the institutions – then how can you be militarizing the entire justice system yeah. to get your political opponent in unprecedented ways? And, and all this talk about how the DOJ and, and Biden, they're not really involved with the Manhattan DA. If you think that there haven't been conversations, or frankly, even if there haven't been conversations, th this, this is very much uh, uh, Henry II, Thomas Beckett, yeah. will no one rid me of this meddlesome priest routine, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> everyone knows what's Everybody happening can here. See. Everyone can see that the Biden administration, I mean, he, he did militarize his own DOJ to go after him in two separate jurisdictions. Yeah. But if you're a state level prosecutor, you're looking at that, you're going, hey, I can, I can make a bank right here. I can mm -hmm. make a mint yeah. simply by going after Donald Trump. If Biden had stepped up and, and said, you know what, this is stupid. We really shouldn't be doing any of this. It's a bad precedent in the United States. That would have been stability. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Frank, uh, by, by the way, my recommendation to Trump, if he were to win a second term, would be that instead of doing the, the kind of blowback as fair game routine, I think it would be a brilliant political move for him to pardon both Hunter and Joe. <laughs> because I think it would take the bat completely out of his opposition's hands. There's nothing they could do. And it, acknowledge, really Joe it acknowledges their guilt. Right, acknowledge it, yes. <laughs> Which is a fun little ancillary Correct. benefit. But here's the thing is, so I, I can often be of the opinion that like moral victories are not victories. And I feel like the, the Democrats have had tremendous success utilizing institutions to increase their power, get their way. And, and whenever you have two sides, like a, a more libertarian-ish Republican party that's like, just leave us alone. And you have another side that's like, we want our enemies crushed. Who do you think wins in a, like, a, a conflict between I, So I, I agree with you, and I think the you know, crush our enemies before us is a good policy when you have the actual power. Mm -hmm. So the question is how you attain the power. And this is where I think that you have this weird divide in conservative media where it's like you know, the Conan the Barbarian yep. and nothing better than to hear the suffering of our enemies. Well, okay, but you have to win in order to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the disconnect between I think the conservative media— Turns out it media. still is a democracy. Yeah, yeah. I mean it, yeah. like right now you can, you can yell at Mike Johnson all you want. He controls one house of— of Congress. Yeah, right. I mean, the reality is you're not going to be rolling back the welfare state with Democrats in control of the Senate and Joe Biden as president. Right? Like, there was a lot of spinning don't in blink, the- Don't blink, don't right? blink. I mean, the, the, I mean the, there's so much of that sort of stuff that's been going on in the Republican Party yeah. for a long time. I mean, you remember, listen, I, I voted for Ted Cruz in the 2016 primaries. Yeah. I like Senator Cruz. But the notion that in 2013, he was going to force Barack Obama to sign a repeal of his own <laughs> signature health care law yeah. by holding up the government was ridiculous. That was never going to happen. Totally. I mean, like, specifically totally. in the presidency, like, let's say Trump wins. Yes. I would support him unleashing the entire Justice Department after every Democrat in this country because I feel like <laughs> we've, we, learned, we learned over the course of about 50 years the only way to make the communist stop is mutually assured destruction. So I can hear that. I, I, honestly, I hear the argument, and I think that really that's a question more of pragmatism than principle that I'm saying. I'm not saying yeah. on principle he shouldn't prosecute Joe mm -hmm. and Hunter. What I'm saying is that as a matter of pragmatic politics, is it more popular or mm -hmm. is it less popular? Meaning we'll ensure future more conservative victories. Right, so th there are times when you do have the power and you go so far that the blowback actually is, is more than it was worth. Mm -hmm. So here I'll put some of the sort of pro-life proposals that were made in the aftermath of Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. where instead of going for what you could get and then gradually moving the line back to conception, which is what I would prefer in some of the states that are more divided, like Michigan, you had the pro-lifers go for broke. And then the next move was the snapback was much more severe than they thought it was going yeah. to be. And, and like so instantly Lindsey Graham right afterwards says, oh, you know, it was actually a lie. We said that we wanted to go back to the states. I'm going to put forward a bill to make it federal. Right, <laughs> exactly. right exactly. Like, there are certain things. Just scaring again, these, the shit out of people. Right? Like, right. These, are, these are pragmatic concerns yeah. as opposed to principal concerns. I think the principal libertarian is like, under no circumstances will we use government to do X. And I, I don't really believe in that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that there are certain things you should not use the government to do on like a, a basic moral level, right? Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants people to be unjustly put in prison. Like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that DAs trump up charges in the way that alvin bragg did i think there are plenty of democrats you can go after who've actually committed criminal acts like i don't think yeah. innocent people should go to jail right. but it, it that is to say that 
You know, there are certain moves that you can make that are harsher and that end up blowing back on you as opposed to moves that you make that are smart. Mm. I think what Republicans ought to do and I think what Trump ought to do is he ought to find every 70-30 issue in this country, and there are a lot of them, and he just – Put his just drive. Put, put, yeah, just put your foot on the on the pedal and put it to the metal on the seventy thirty issues and spend the next three, four, five years for the Republican Party, like really building up this sort of momentum on the on these sorts of issues because the Democratic Party, I think they're going to continue fringing out. I don't think there's any moderation in their future. Well, right? especially if they they lose because in twenty sixteen they had that coping mechanism of Russia, 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 and all this bullshit, and that stopped them from having this you know, warfare within their party about what the future of it looks yeah, like. Instead, right. they could just blame Russia and say Donald Trump's an aberration. But if he comes back and he beats Joe Biden, Biden somehow gets through to election day, like they're going to have a food fight oh, on I their hands wait. on what the future of what the coalition looks well, it's like. It's going to look a lot like it. What's very weird about it is it's kind of like the argument against capitalism in the aftermath of the 2000, 2000, 2007, yeah. 2008 crash, where it was like, this is capitalism's fault. And we were all like, wait, what? <laughs> like, wait, like, what about the Community Reinvestment Act? And yeah. this is actually a perverse government. So you're blaming capitalism for a thing capitalism didn't do. Democrats are going to blame moderation for a thing moderation did not do. Of course right? they, they, they all perceive Joe Biden as moderate, despite yeah. the fact that we're all sitting here and going, there is nothing moderate right. about this guy policies. And so they are likely to swivel incredibly far to the left, specifically in order to cater to the Hamas crowd that's, mm -hmm. that's hanging out on college campuses. You know, I, I think that Republicans, if they can hold it together, yeah. have in store for them a pretty positive future here, given the fact that the Democrats are driving directly off the hill. Now, mm -hmm. listen, I could talk to you for 10 hours about all this stuff. I know we got to get, get you out of here, but you just heard, I think, why this guy is as good as he is and mm -hmm. one of the voices of the conservative movement for the foreseeable future my man because you got both the principal and the pragmatic side you sew them all together make a compelling case thank you for coming on this yeah, i appreciate it thank you guys thanks so much well we want to thank ben for coming in that was an awesome deal yeah, nice to time. stop on by have friends in the neighborhood do what they do great conversation but coming out of that i think that's a good question for our audience right i mean one of the things that struck us was the conversation that you were having about the cognitive test. Yeah. I mean, that's like the Achilles heel for Biden right now. It, I mean, it truly is. And your point, I think, was really well taken in that it's his biggest problem. If you were Joe Biden, would you take this thing? Yeah. That, that's the question, is, is if you are dear listeners, we want to highlight whoever has the best responses because that is the million-dollar question. It could solve all of Biden's problems if he takes it, or it could bury him if it takes it and it goes bad. So. Yeah, right. 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 If you're him, like, do you just roll the dice and not take it, or do you take it and try to stop people from talking about it? But, like, not taking it. Yeah. Yeah. Eh. I think, look, he's a Democrat, so he could probably get away with having somebody else take it for him, <laughs> and then <laughs> the media right. will cover it up. It was like that, uh, did you guys follow back in the uh, old NFL days when they used to do the drug testing and some guy had a fake wiener? Yeah. <laughs> it was called the Wizenator. Yeah. That's what it, <laughs> it was like literally, it came in like different flesh tones. Yeah. And they would use it to try to fool. <laughs> yeah. I don't Biden's, think it would work for the cognitive. Biden's going to have a, do use a fake wiener it's for like, a test? It's like a fake brain, like Wizenator, yeah. essentially. <laughs> Pal, I don't think they make those. <laughs> <laughs> so if you didn't have the Wizenator, would you take the test or not? That's the question. That is the funniest yeah. thing. I, I, uh. All right. So those are the questions. We read the, all these on uh, over the weekend. We'll get back to you on Tuesday. Uh, we will read all your responses, and then we owe you one from this week as well. Because, I mean, believe me, this controls more of our show than we like to admit. Um, let's go to our sponsor. Guys, one of the things that we've been like into lately, and I think it shows by our intellect, yeah, is this Synalytic yeah. situation. Yeah, Qualia Synalytic. It's a, it's a great product. And I, would I have to mention, so I was at a wedding last weekend. <clears throat> and you know my mom is a, uh, a consumer of, yeah. of this show, loves the show, yep. watches it all the time. Yep. We try not to offend her. Yeah. Well, that's you make that very difficult okay. sometimes, yeah. Michael. Whatever. But uh, so she was like, this, uh, this qualia, this uh, senolytic stuff. Yeah. You, you taking that? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, Mom, I'm taking it. And she's like, I noticed. Oh, oh really? She's like, Interesting. You look good. You seem sharper. You look good. You look know? good. Yeah. I'm not even sure they advertise that that's part of the thing. But... Well, no, I think she was just like, Well, it does overall... the anti-aging. It, like, yeah. gets rid of the bad cells. Yeah, maybe my, my skin looked better. I don't know. I mean, you do look great. I thought maybe it was just I shaved. Yeah. But um, 
but it could be that too. You do look sharp. Our, all of you look very sharp. No question about that. Thank and I, I, it's probably the quality of analytics. So that is the thing is uh, scientists have described how, like, the body has, you know, essentially like the dead cells that are essentially mm-hmm. just junking up the place. This cleans it right on out. And, and that mm. might be what she's talking about. It also could be functioning sort of as the whizinator for Joe Biden <laughs> if he would just take our product you here. Would. I don't think so, man. The yeah. whizinator is developed by some guy on the street. This is developed by, like, a Ph.D. scientist. Okay. Well, that's true. I mean, there is technology involved in the Wizenator, but not <laughs> anything. It's more of a more of a feat of engineering, yes. than this, which is brain science and That's stuff. Right. That's right. Quality is analytic, and uh, <laughs> we're not joking about this at all. We actually do take it, and I, I, I think I do feel better. <laughs> yeah. To be honest yeah. with you, like I, it seems to be working for me. I think everybody ought to give it a shot. It, there is actual science that goes into that. Your body ac- accumulates it with its sentient, sentient cells. Yeah, they call them the zombie cells to make it easy to understand. Yeah, oh, right. Okay. And it's it's stuff. It's dead stuff. And yeah. this just sort of cleans it all out, gets you to a little higher function. Yeah. And it's not. You only take it two days a month. It's not a lot of work. It's not like something you have to add to your daily schedule. Two days a month gets the job done. Which I think is key because when when people are asking you to add something new to your routine every single yeah, like day, you're like, how many things can I throw in there? Yeah. Twice a month. Doable. Get done. out of here. That's great. Very doable. So resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualia Analytic. Go to neurohacker.com backslash ruthless for up to $100 off and use code RUTHLESS at the checkout for an additional 15%. Mm. Quite a deal. That's neurohacker.com backslash RUTHLESS for an extra 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Neurohacker for sponsoring today's episode. All right, so we've got some variety. You guys want to do some variety? Yes. Absolutely. I think we got to do some variety. This one, uh, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do first. I know which one I want to do, but let's just start with this one. It, it we'll save a little bit of candy because the, the second one is like breathtaking. Bonkers. Breathtaking. So this is according to The Independent. Uh, mm-hmm. AI brings Black Mirror episode to life with program that stimulates speaking to dead loved ones. Or simulates, oh, simulates it. It's like essentially, I mean, this is so twisted and dark. Uh, <laughs> they're using AI to mimic one of your dead loved ones so you can talk to them. Mm. So but, but, I got to read a little bit about it. Okay, so when, when Michael Bomber found out that he was terminally ill with colon cancer, he spent a lot of time with his wife, Annette, talking about what would happen after his death. She told him that one of the things she'd miss most is being able to talk to him about questions whenever she wants because he's so well-read and always shares his wisdom. Bomber recalled during a recent interview at his home in the leafy Berlin suburb. Mm. Uh, that conversation sparked an idea for Bomber. And it recreate his voice using artificial intelligence to survive after he had passed away. The 61-year-old startup entrepreneur teamed up with his friend, uh, Robert Locasio, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. a CEO of an AI-powered legacy platform, Eternos. And within months, they built a comprehensive interactive AI version of what Bomber was talking about. Mm. Uh, how do we feel about this? Okay. Dark. Yeah. Here, here's... here's- I think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. You guys remember two months ago, maybe three months ago, when AI came onto the scene, everybody was texting into AI and, and AI was spitting out this like liberal, inane nonsense, right? You're yeah. like, tell me a joke and they tell you some lib nonsense, right? <laughs> so ostensibly, AI ingests people's voices into the system, right? And then they try to like, in, in the person's voice who you loved, they tell you something that might be meaningful to you. So what happens on June 1st when oh. your grandpa says, happy Pride Month, grandson? <laughs> yeah. That's ne- that would never happen. So it's like, oh, I know it's a phony. I know it has nothing to do with my grandfather and therefore fake. I don't think it's going to work. It would be the greatest punk of all time to have a smug... With liberal talking points. It, that's my, that's so my point. Hor- that, horrific. That's my point. You open your Apple calendar on your iPhone and it's like six notifications. Today is the first day of Pride Month. Today is the, It's like, so you know that they will apply the same technology because that, while there are some unique facts. Wait, do you think, so it's going to be like generationally appropriate? So somebody that died like, I don't know, in the 80s. Uh, it, all of a sudden, it like uh, puts their views into 2024. I think that's the whole problem. I mean, that's 
essentially the biggest crisis we're facing, whether it's in movies or whatever. They're like, oh, we're going to remake uh, Pocahontas, but, you know, it's going to be through the prism of colonialism and, like, this bullshit. So, like, I bet Ashbrook's on to something. They will 100% shoehorn their bullshit into this. <laughs> Grandson, I am really disappointed in President Trump and his 34 guilty counts. Yeah. You know, like, it's, it's no, the first no week way. of June, Grandson. I don't want to tell you about storming D-Day. I want to tell you the importance of Pride Month. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. I gotta say, I'm at. a little conflicted on this one. Okay, uh, I'd like to hear it because, well, I, I agree with everything that y'all have said already on this. But and I'm going to go ahead and defend um, the boomers here, which you know I'm loath to do as, as one who's attacked the boomers on many occasions. There's nothing worse than like losing a, like a loved one, a mm-hmm. spouse, you know, towards the end of your own life, and like feeling lonely. And if they could get this technology to a place that made people feel good, you know, the last years of their life, yeah, I would be for that. Okay, at the end, I get it, but like, there's also something to closure. No, I see, and and that's why I'm sort of conflicted on it. Is like it is sort of an affront to like nature. I read on it in this article, by the way, Smash. The users can further train the AI system by answering questions about their lives political views or Come very on. aspects exactly. about their personality. Exactly. So you could you could you'd be like, oh man, just he was an incredible racist. <laughs> and like does that mean the AI spits out just like the most derogatory stuff of all time? Or be like it's- Grandpa Ashbrook was based as hell. (laughs) (laughs) Don't bullshit me, AI. (laughs) He wouldn't have tried to tell me that Joe Biden is sharp as can be. Yeah. I mean, like, there's no way that, like, you could see, you could see the libs in their AI algorithm making things up to help Democrats because that's what they do. Yeah, but I mean, if they're trying to if they're trying to sell the product to people, like that, that shit isn't going to work. So it's either not going to work or they're going to make a lot of money. And they're going to be incentivized to make it as personalized as possible, right? I would think, but again, I, I, where I have the like the moral problem yeah, of this I, is that I've watched yeah. a lot of people, unfortunately, um, suffer the death of a loved one prematurely, and they closure is a big piece of like they can't mm-hmm. can't actually move on with their life, like they just they just can't do it yeah. unless they have the close. And if every night there was the temptation to go talk to a box that sounded like your loved one like ah, it's got a Dude, prolonged right. pain yeah it? Well, but you could i mean i think you're right ma- ma- maybe but like okay my like my wife and i love watching movies together and your wife would be happy to talk to the box i'll be honest with you <laughs> maybe. But, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the highlights after we get the kids down at night like the highlight of my night is that, like if we're gonna watch a movie And, like, the commentary between us as we watch a movie, good or bad, you know, like, B-movie or, like, blockbuster. Right. You know, always have good commentary back and forth. So the idea of being able to put the box and I can still get some of those that funny commentary. You got good bits. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying it's like like a 21st century version of a photo album. Sometimes you Mm. pull out the photo album and you start flipping through the pictures and you remember the old times. Yeah. You have your head movies. Right. Yeah. It makes it harder to adjust if uh, your wife got remarried. Yeah, it'd be a tough deal. <laughs> it'd be a real tough deal. It's just listening to you chirp on a B movie. Maybe, you know what? You know what? In, in, in that instance, I'd insist upon it. Like, it's me, part of the will. Yeah. I, m- the box of me will follow you through the rest of your life. But maybe, not, this, not, maybe that's the market. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's, that's the market. That's the market right yeah. there. That's it. That's how you snide, it. So snide into your comments will. and judgment you for the rest not, of your life. You will not forget me. <laughs> From beyond the grave. <laughs> I will haunt you forever. Of course he laughed at that. He's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So our second bit of variety, and this is where this thing gets hilarious. Dunks, I think you found this one. A remote Amazon tribe finally connects to the internet, only to wind up hooked on porn and social media. (laughs) Yeah, if AI were to create a segment for the variety of the variety program, this is it. This is what they would do. (laughs) So let me read just a couple of things. This is from the New York Post. A reclusive tribe in the Amazon finally got hooked up to the internet thanks to Elon Musk, only to be torn apart by social media and pornography addiction. Elders complain. Brazil's 2,000-member Marubo tribe has been left bitterly divided by the arrival of Tesla's founder, uh, Starlink, service uh, nine months ago. It's only been nine months. That's all it took. (laughs) 
Councilman, which connected the remote rainforest community along the Itui River uh, to the web for the very first time. When it arrived, everyone was happy, says name unpronounceable Maruba, uh, 73, told the New York Times this. Uh, but now things have gotten worse. Young people have gotten lazy because of the Internet. They're learning the ways of the white people. <laughs> I, I, I've <laughs> nothing. Fair enough. Nothing. Nothing says the Internet is a disease <laughs> quite like this story. Amerigo Vespucci brought malaria blankets. Modern man brings the Internet. <laughs> so uh, they frown upon this is a tribe that's like, you know, totally you read about these things from yeah. time to time, mm -hmm. totally disconnected from the outside world. They only kind of known themselves forever. All of a sudden they drop the Internet. And they, these people frown upon, according to the article, they frown upon kissing in public. Mm -hmm. They don't care for it. Well, they got some customs. Certainly changed now. I mean, they've like... got some customs, uh, but they, uh, Alfredo Marubo. They all are Marubos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all take the last name. Yeah, they're all Marubos. Uh, he said he's anxious for the arrival of the service, which delivers super fast internet in far flung corners of the planet, and has been billed as a game changer by Musk. Could up in standards of decorum. Alfredo said many young Marubo men have been sharing porn videos in group chats. <laughs> and they're in group chats. They have they already chats. Got group chats, dude. Yeah. They're in group so chats. So they have more than the internet. They've got iPhones. And they've already observed more aggressive sexual behavior in mm. some of them. We're worried the young people are going to want to try it. He said of kinky sex acts they've been suddenly exposed to on the screen. Also, this is like the ultimate example of that, like, reject modernity. <laughs> In action, where it's like now most people who have the unfortunate uh, uh, lot in life of having to live in a city always dream of being like, God, I wish I could just move out to the country. Life would be so beautiful. I wouldn't have to deal with all this like crime and horrible shit and I could just enjoy my day to day life. And, and now you see the exact opposite of it is like now the vices have come to people who had that like pastoral dream you have of like, oh, you know, it's green as far as the eye can see. There's no smog. It's wonderful. And as soon as the internet arrives, it all goes to shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, malaria I mean, blanket. I mean, I think part of the oh, part of the problem blanket. is like this is a society that has it, it has. What the fuck, man? <laughs> it's like, this is a society that has has no benefit to the positive influences of technology and the internet. Like, so like that's a good point. You know what I mean? Like, they have no need for the rest of civilization because they yeah, live they're the not way getting that they Amazon do. deliveries. Yeah, they're not going on YouTube. And well, now like, they can. How do I cut down a tree? You know, they're or not like, doing e-commerce on yeah. here. Right. But like there's great things about technology and the internet and all of this sort of stuff, but they have no use for that. So like we're seeing the real dark underbelly of society. Dude, that's that a good point. Like, you know what I mean? It's like if it's not it's a true. tool for use of like, what are you doing? You're emailing work and shit? Like, yeah. no. Yeah. It's 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 proof of that saying, you know, idle hands are the devil's plaything. There you go, dude. You know? you don't, yeah, that's a good point. You don't think they're reading like all the stories from Arabella Advisors on <laughs> how Pride Month <laughs> makes you better, and now they're like, oh, now we know about Pride Month. Our tribe is better. No, I did not. <laughs> I'd love if they were like uh, hooked on the first iteration of like the X reboot, where it's just nothing but murders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. They're like, whoa. <laughs> Just porn, <laughs> porn bots and murders. Porn bots and murders. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, this is obviously not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, for these people and probably says a little bit of something about ourselves in the process. Uh, all right. We wanted to uh, work into the program. Emily Seidel, who's the CEO of AFP, terrific friend of the program, you got to hear a little bit about the work that they're up to right now because it is important. Mm -hmm. There's really, really good stuff in here. Uh, let's get to that interview. <laughs> want to welcome back a very special guest, someone you've heard from multiple times here on the Variety Program because we appreciate the good work that she does both on the political side and the policy side. Emily Seidel, welcome. Thank you. Listen, you got a lot going on. Yes, we do. A lot going on. A lot going and on. Where should we start? Well, can I can I choose? Yeah. All right. So last time y'all had me in here, first of all, this is a very nice setup. Last time we were around <laughs> a conference table. Has <laughs> it been that long? Yes. Well, I mean, we did the live event down in D.C. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But last time was right before the 2022 midterms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we were talking about how there was this red wave coming. Mm -hmm. And I was saying... When we were out in the in the field with the grassroots talking to voters, we did not see that red wave coming. Hmm. 
I want to use some of our time together to raise the flag on that again ahead mm. of 2024. Mm, okay. Because Biden is incredibly unpopular. Yeah, mm. right. But his unpopularity is not winning these Senate races right mm. now. And we see that in the in the polling. I can share some of our internal polling. and But we also see that in the conversations that we're hap- having with with voters across the country mm-hmm. right now. And so that's re- I'd love to talk about that if that's good. Yeah, oh, please. Perfect. Let's do it. So I, I think there are a couple of things happening. So first of all, the Democratic incumbents in some of the t- tightest races. And so when I talk about these races, I'm talking about Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Montana, and Nevada. Yep. Those are the five races where AFP action is engaged right now. You can also throw Michigan into the mix there. We're not engaged in that race yet. It's a little bit different because it's an open seat. Right. Yep. The rest of these have Democratic incumbent senators yep. running for re-election. So in these races, Biden has, on average, a negative 29-point <laughs> image. Yeah, and, and that ain't great. People don't like it in these states. <laughs> <laughs> right. But the, on average, the Democratic incumbents have a net positive rating of about two points. Mm-hmm. And so I mean, that's a 30 point spread. Yeah, it's not sticky like it used to be. No. Right. And and you you hear this when you're talking to voters at the door as well. I was in uh, Pennsylvania, right outside of Pittsburgh, talking to voters a couple of weeks ago. And I talked to this guy who's outside sweeping his porch mm-hmm. so he couldn't get away from me. And uh, and and. He was pretty emblematic of which, what we're hearing from a lot of these swing voters. He, First of all, when you ask him just generally about the election, they start at the top of the ticket. These swing voters, by and large, are not excited about either of the choices that they have. Yeah. Great opportunity to pivot to talk about the Senate races. And when I started talking to him about the Senate race in Pennsylvania, he said, well, you know, I've heard, heard a little bit about this Dave McCormick guy, some good, some bad. Want to learn more? He said, but Senator Casey, I think he's a good man. Mm. I like him, right? Like, that's how how it's feeling on the ground. It's You're seeing it reflected in the polling. It's the power of incumbency. Yeah, exactly. Right. Second thing is um, split ticket voting. Mm-hmm. So it's a thing, right? It happens. Mm-hmm. Montana uh, in 2012, oh, I think yeah. Romney won by 14 points, yeah. but Senator Tester was reelected by three points, right? So one in five voters basically split their ticket at Montana. We continue to see that in some of the numbers right now, but on steroids. Mm-hmm. So again, across these Senate states that I mentioned, 30% on average of the voters who are saying they're going to vote for the Democrat also don't like Biden. Mm. So they're separating in their minds the Democratic president from the Democratic senator mm-hmm. in a major, major way. Yep. And this is really happening, especially amongst swing voters. So in Ohio, deep red state at this point, mm-hmm. didn't used to be, but is is now, Trump's going to win that state. Yep. Um, we have in our internal polls, Moreno down just outside of the margin of error, uh, against Senator Brown, but Biden is losing swing voters in Ohio by like seven points. Yeah, but Brown is winning them by fifteen. Yeah. So this is the this is the challenge, and I'll tell you the last thing that I'll say is as you talk to these swing and these independent voters across the country, one of the biggest surprises, quite frankly, that I've I've had is they are not holding their Democratic senators accountable for the decisions that they've made on their behalf mm-hmm. in Washington, D.C. So you go to the door and you ask them, what's the most important thing to you? What's the biggest policy issue in your mind right now? And you're going to hear one of two things. Either you're going to hear something about the economy, inflation, and cost of living, mm-hmm. or you're going to hear about border security and, and immigration. Mm-hmm. And even within states, you know, in like northwest Wisconsin, it's one thing. In southeast yep. Wisconsin, yeah, that's right. a difference. Regional so differences. Right. The value of being in the grassroots, talking to voters, being able to meet them where they are, of course. But when we start to then engage them on those issues and educate them about what their senator has done in Washington, D.C., or more to the point, especially on border security, not done, mm-hmm. They're not. They're not thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and and so n- these senators are not paying a political price yet for supporting the radical Biden Harris agenda. Yeah. So those numbers that you laid out are terrifying to anybody who cares about uh, changing uh, the majority in the Senate. And everything that you said, I can I can see how how it gets that way. But I want to I want to dig in on the last point you made, mm-hmm. and I know that you guys are going. You guys spend time at doors. You talk to people. You don't just drop off lit and right. walk away. You are asking them 
questions to get the answers that you just uh, told our listeners about. I'm wondering when you're when when the you know the the people are hitting the doors and having these conversations, are there any messages that make the voters think, oh wow, you know what? Bob Casey really is a problem on the border because he has been voting for open borders and Biden and Schumer and everything. Is there, is there anything that you think is working? So on the on the border, I mean, people are just worried about their families. They're worried mm -hmm. about their safety, their kids at school and, you know, asking somebody for an Advil and it not being Advil. I mean, yeah, um, the, the thing that I'm seeing work the most right now actually is more on the economy side mm -hmm. because it's just fear on the border security side, fear for the safety of their families. But when we talk about border security, you know, they recognize that stunts like what the president did this week, those things aren't going to actually solve the problem. Mm -hmm. We need Congress to act. Mm -hmm. And we can get into a conversation about that. That's one of the big campaigns that AFP separately is running right now, actually, is the Secure Borders, Secure America right. campaign. Um, but really, people just want to talk about it, their fears on the border and be heard when you start talking about the kitchen table issues, the economy, inflation, and cost of living, that's where you see the sort of aha moment mm -hmm. when they are able to connect the dots between the votes for trillions of dollars in reckless spending, the support for a, a regulatory environment that just doesn't make sense, and, and they can understand intuitively how it's stifling business and our economy, and just the shutting off of energy production that they feel every time they go to fill up their gas tanks. I mean, mm -hmm. those are the sorts of things that start to connect the dots for the voters as we're talking to them. Yeah, it's an interesting dynamic, too, because you've got on the top of the ticket two ubiquitously known individuals in Joe Biden and Donald Trump. I mean, you can be anywhere mm -hmm. in this country. You may love them, you may hate them, but you got an opinion about the two of them. Yeah. And then you got a bunch of incumbents, as you said. Very difficult to beat Senate Democratic or Republican incumbents, for that matter. Incumbency is a very big advantage in Senate elections. And then you've got overlapping on top of that Pennsylvania with McCormick. You've got Hovde in Wisconsin, obviously Bernie Moreno in Ohio, Tim Sheehy in Montana. You're talking about a bunch of people who are running for the first time in a general election statewide. Mm -hmm. So there's a name ID issue. Huge issue. And there is a incumbency issue, and then there is obvious ballot separation at the top because mm -hmm. there everybody knows who these people are. So it compounds, I think, what it is that you're talking about here in that if we're going to get to a place where we're winning these Senate elections, you got to close the ballot gap. You got to increase the name ID. We have to do a lot of education, and that's what you guys are doing, AFPA. That's exactly what we're doing. So first on the education gap. So. Bidenomics is one of the big campaigns that we're doing. We just launched our bus tour nationwide mm -hmm. just before Memorial Day. Um, and, you know, I love the fact that the president thought that the economy was so great and he wanted to name it after himself. <laughs> I mean, it's wild, right? And <laughs> what a dumb move. It's so in dumb. A, in a history of full of dumb moves. And, but then it immediately backfired. And it's like his comms team said, OK, well, never mind. And the rest of the the plan, let's just put it on the shelf. It is funny how quickly they walked away from it. But they didn't pay attention to the URL. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this we bought, the greatest, so bought the I love URL. this we thing. We bought Bidenomics.com. So yeah. And you, you guys <laughs> right. can go and read the truth yeah. about his policies, his agenda, and how it impacts the the economy. So we get out there with, with the URL, and then we start doing these events at gas stations and grocery stores, the places where the Biden economy and, and his Bidenomics agenda is hurting people the most. Yeah. We've been doing this for two years, yeah. by the way. Um, yeah, this is not an outfit that showed up yesterday. No. And, you guys are deeply embedded in these communities. And and I'll tell you, the, st the stories that we continue to hear, I was just down in Florida uh, doing a gas station event with a team down there, mm -hmm. and there was a guy who was getting kind of impatient because his wife was pumping the gas, and she was talking to us for a long time. <laughs> so he got out of his car, and he said, honey, you need some help with the gas, and he didn't understand what was happening. So we explained and then he started telling us about how he owns a welding business and how his employees are suffering, but he can't afford to pay them yeah. anymore. Um, and he broke down in tears and got all embarrassed and got oh, back in the man. car. But it was, it, th that's that's not a one off, no. right? Like people are really hurting. Sixty percent of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, yeah. and right now under Bidenomics, they have to pay 
over $1,000 more on average a month Mm -hmm. just to afford the standard of living that they had before. Mm -hmm. You're living paycheck to paycheck. You can't even dream of of totally pumping up a thousand dollars more a month. Totally. So, so this is this is what what this is how we can connect with people and then connect them to what's you know the the agenda in Washington and how it impacts their daily lives to start to hold accountable the lawmakers who have enabled this agenda. We're doing it across states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Montana, Nevada, and many congressional districts where these congressmen and women could have stood in the way of this. Oh, yeah. And, and they didn't. All the way from the shores of Alaska to the Jersey Shore, out east and everywhere in between. This is this is um, the power of a, of a national grassroots army. Yeah, and I think do this. Like the beauty of what AFP, AFPA, what you guys do is you're talking to people who are taking kids to softball practice, right? Or they're working two jobs to try to make things work. They got stuff going on, yeah. right? They're not just sitting there like consuming political news right. all day. They'll think about it when they got time to vote, but this is not anywhere near the front burner. They know they're suffering, but like connecting all of that is not, they don't have time for that. Yeah, exactly. And what you guys do is in a, in a trusted voice within their communities, go talk to people. Let them know. Help people connect the dots on it. Because you're right. At the end of the day, all the people who we're trying to beat are the people who created all of this. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it's the same thing that we're doing on the border. So I said earlier that people are just really concerned, really scared about safety and security. And so what we want to do is make it possible for them to be advocates for real, meaningful congressional action, Mm -hmm. because that's what it's going to take to actually solve this problem. Yeah. So uh, we've got a nationwide tour Going on right now, we've been fortunate to partner with retired uh, Border Chief Chris Clem. Many people have probably seen him on TV before. He's fantastic. He's an advisor to us on this issue. And we're out there helping people become activists Mm -hmm. uh, to to encourage Congress to recognize that it's not just a one, you know, there's not just one solution to this. We need more agents. We need more wall. Yeah. We need technological solutions, more surveillance on the border. There's so much that needs to happen, and it's going to take congressional action to get it done. So, again, we're doing this tour specifically in the places where we believe there are congressmen and women and senators who could take principled action here, haven't, Mm -hmm. need to be held accountable and get out of the way, or start bulking down and actually getting it done. So I'm I'm curious on the issue of the border, because we talked a lot about the economy and inflation and all that sort of stuff, because I've heard from a couple of pollsters, and I'm curious if this has ever come up in any of your polling, that there's an economic message on the issue of border security, specifically with suburban swing voters that resonates, and that is like, local school district funding getting diverted out of their community to house migrants to yeah. do, to do all of these things where like you know now it's not just an issue on the southern border or an issue of like yeah, crime it's every and fentanyl community. it's literally my school district mm-hmm. have you seen anything like that a little bit mm-hmm. it's mostly f- from what we've been hearing from the the swing voters that we've been talking to it's mostly a more of a security issue than a funding mm-hmm issue, but I could see that creeping mm-hmm. in for sure. Yeah, I mean, increasingly, look, I'm glad you're doing this specifically, in addition to all the great work that you guys do, because I feel like it's the first time, man, I've been doing it 20 years, it's the first time where the issue is bled beyond a center-right conservative coalition of people who are concerned about this into the middle and the center-left, Yeah, right? And maybe even deeper into the left, and that everybody sort of recognizes we got a real problem here. Maybe that just moment in time is the right opportunity to actually do something because lord knows people have tried yeah. and come up snake eyes for 15 years on this thing yeah uh, amen i agree yeah. with you yeah well the thing i i just say quickly one of the things i love about your project more than anything is that you actually are out talking to real people and that's something joe biden would never do you know he, <laughs> well, i don't think he can he, well he can, yeah but even <laughs> even if he like does like a big pr event in some state out there he it, it's it's completely like washed with dem operatives and like he's he's never actually talking to anybody real because anybody real would give them a serious piece of their mind. Well, he'll, right? he'll ask him to do a push-up contest and call him fat. Well, <laughs> <laughs> my, my point is you're giving voice to a lot of people who feel like they have none. 
And I think that's a very special project, and I'm really glad you guys are doing it, because if you weren't, who would? Well, thank you. And, you know, the... So we've got to do this this voter education on these issues. We've also got to go out and win these races. Yeah. And so AFP action at this point, we've knocked on over a million doors just across these these five Senate races. That's great. Um, and we're not going to let up. One of the things that I think is is important, and would love anybody to join us if yeah. they are willing to, they to volunteer you? some time. You can go to americansforprosperity.org. You can go to afpaction.com. You can go to bidenomics.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can go to securebordersecureamerica.com. <laughs> there are a lot of different places that you can you can reach and, and sign up with any of these things that we're doing. But the point is that all of it together is so critical. Mm-hmm. You can't just do the education piece. You can't just do the election piece. You have to do all of it. And that's what, you know, I'm blessed to work with this organization that does this 24-7, 365, whether it's a, an election year or non-election year. We're the only group that can walk and chew multiple pieces of gum all at the same time, coast to coast. And um, that's what it's going to take to turn this country well, around. we've seen it firsthand and can absolutely testify to that. You guys can do it, and you are doing it, which we greatly appreciate. We also appreciate the friendship here at the Ruthless Variety Program. We've enjoyed working with you guys over the years. Likewise. And I hope, as you're learning more, you keep coming back and giving us tidbits from the field because this is – information that you're not going to get any kind of polling. Absolutely. Happy awesome. to do it. Emily, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love every time she comes on the show. Her group is huge, and they're doing really, really important work, and we are fortunate to have a relationship with them. Yeah, legit boots on the ground. They're, they're moving the ball. Yeah, and I think it's important canary in the coal mine on some of these Senate races and the stuff she was talking about. We missed an opportunity there in 2022 in a lot of these places. I think... Like the silver lining is, and we've talked about this previously on the show, is like now there's an apples to apples comparison of the Donald Trump years and the Biden years, you know, four years of the economic downturn under Joe Biden. Good point. And I think that argument will be easier to make to these suburban swing voters about like what Bidenomics has done to you. We had trouble breaking through on that message in 2022, and I hope we can turn it around. And I also, look, she highlighted something in my mind that I think we just need to be more explicit about, right? If you have a problem with Joe Biden, if you're not going to vote for Joe Biden, if you know anybody who's not going to vote for Joe Biden, by God, don't let them vote for another Democrat in the federal level on this ticket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that made it happen. That's right. Mm-hmm. Enablers. They're the ones that did it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like he, this doddering old idiot is sitting in the White House and he gets a microphone. He doesn't have a bully pulpit. Like, whatever. These guys willingly went in and enforced a progressive, radical left agenda, voted for all of it, soup to nuts. Every time a border bill came up, Mm -hmm. nope. That's right. They don't want it. Every time any sort of economic uh, growth thing was discussed, nope. 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 We're we're all for just flooding our our marketplace with cash and increasing inflation and everything. They did it. Mm-hmm. These these are the people – like if you're living in – I was so struck by the Bob Casey example that you talked about, right? Mm-hmm. Where somebody's like, I think he's a good man. Oh, do you? How, why? Why? Mm-hmm. Because it, I don't know what your family – like if you felt the, the pain of the economy, if you felt inflation, if you have anybody you know – Who's struggling? They did it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Bob Casey did it. Did you hear him ask a single question? He didn't ask a single question. His vote was never in question. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever saw. Well, is, is Bob Casey going to vote for this? No, there's never a discussion. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like, of course he's going to vote. He votes Democrat regardless. He's going to vote liberal policies regardless. Sheriff Brown, same thing. Right? John Tester, same thing. He loves to pick something that doesn't matter where his vote doesn't matter. He's like, oh no, I'm on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. Or he'll talk tough on the like the board. That's my favorite. Yeah. He's like, oh, and we need border security. He's like, I don't know, buddy. You've been here for 20 years. They talk tough. They don't vote tough. They don't vote tough. He's got a new attack ad up on Tim Sheehy saying he's like a pal with lobbyists or something. And you know who took like the most lobbyist The number cash? one. John Tester. The number one. <laughs> the number one recipient of special interest money, lobbyist money is John Tester. So like, don't let your friends and neighbors yep. process this. And it's, look, I understand there's some split ticket stuff. We may have different opinions and different relationships downtown. I don't, but some people do. And if you do, that's fine. But they're not senators. Yeah. I mean, Joe Biden got away with a, like, nice Uncle Joe con. That's what all these other red state Dem senators are counting on. Yeah. They're they counting can get away with on that it. Con. They're counting on it. 
but they've been the chief enablers of all the pain that you know now. Mm -hmm. Take a look at your foreign policy. You know how easy it would be for Congress to figure out a way to hem this administration in if you had Republican majorities? They won't do it. Mm -hmm. They won't even ask a question about it. Shit, the board would be no. fixed in a minute. Just build a pier that falls apart in two weeks. Yeah. And then, and and then we all paid for For Gaza. And then, you it, know, it, for Gaza. Yeah. yeah. To give for money Gaza. to Hamas. Yeah. So anyway, hold these people accountable. We're going to do more of this. She just helped illuminate all of this to me in a way that, like, we got to spend more time doing it. Because yeah. apparently some people aren't still connecting. None of you yeah. who listen to the program, know. you know what we're talking about. We also want to acknowledge today, right? Today. It's the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Mm -hmm. What an important reminder of what this country is at its very best. The, the men that we had storming those beaches, doing it for their country, knowing that they were almost absolutely going to lose their lives and did it anyway, and then managed to like pull themselves back together, those who survived D-Day, and go win World War II. What an incredible feat. Yeah. So the, I don't know if you guys saw this, but online there was a video of a group of high school students in France, like 4,000, one report I saw. It was a huge auditorium filled with high school kids. And they had some American vets wheeled out in Normandy. And these kids gave the old guys a standing ovation that lasted four minutes. Oh, I love that. So think about that. Think about the, the impact that lasts generations that those guys made. 80 years ago. 80 mm. years ago, and there are still kids in high school. You know, we complain about the American high schoolers and, and our Zoomer generation. 80 years later, kids in France standing and clapping for these 90-year-old guys in wheelchairs yeah. for what they did. I mean, I, I like, I think everybody should be thinking about that. There's still, there's still a reverence over there for that sort of thing. You know, if you, if you get the privilege of going to Normandy and you're in uh, one of those cemeteries there on Omaha Beach or, or where, where have you, Utah Beach, whatever, um, you know, on the hour, every hour, they play the American National Anthem. Yeah. And it, it like, being there in that moment really changes you, and you, oh, you get a perspective on it. Really something. It really is uh, the best that we had to offer and trying to recapture as a country, because it, we should never forget it. Never. Because it is an amazing sacrifice on behalf of all of us. Anyway, hats off to all the veterans, the very few that are still surviving. I know mm -hmm. all of us, we talked the other week about how we all had grandfathers and things like that that fought in World War II and are long since passed. There are a few who made an honor flight last week that I saw, which I found fantastic. It's amazing. Really cool. You know, very, very cool. Anyway, thank you for joining us. It's been a hell of a week. Thank Ben Shapiro, obviously, for coming in. Uh, that was an awesome banger of a start of an episode. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to subscribe to the YouTube to see it all. Remember, that's free of charge. Yeah. Free to subscribe. Free of charge. Free, free to subscribe and uh, and be with us because we got some big announcements. Yes. We're working on a couple of really big things. I mean really big things. It's exciting. A very exciting time to be part of the Ruthless Variety program. Smug, with that, I think we did it. I think so. Absolute banger of an episode. John, thanks so much, Emily Seidel. Thank you so much, Ben Shapiro, and thank you to the Minions. Remember, let us know. If you were Biden, would you take that cognitive test? So, until <laughs> next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. We'll see you on Tuesday. Stay ruthless.